after the after the bid round. I think it's going to come. Um, your point, Karen, is good about it. These are public assets, after all, so, and very important assets. On the uh, leverage issue that uh, Laurie raised, I think uh, th that has been eroded by the substantial resource revenues going into these countries. But we are finding that there is still a demand uh, uh, and a willingness to talk to um, the IFIs for the for the non-financial aspects, um, you, uh, the technical advice, technical assistance in how to spend the money and how to manage the resources, and also for good housekeeping seals of approval, which still means something for access to other people's finance, if, if not ours. Um, the one last point I was going to mention was the on the, uh, the financial thing. I couldn't agree more that, uh, that um, on the importance of the banks and the banking sector and, um, and bringing them into this whole discussion. Uh, we've started that. As Karen said, there's another meeting planned soon in London, isn't it? Or is that just happening? Yes. No, it's going to be in October. Yeah, oh, October. Yeah. October. But that, we've had a, a preliminary meetings. The banks that I've met with have been slightly apprehensive about uh, what they call a, a publish what you borrow and publish what you lend um, approach to the whole thing. And they, but they, they stayed engaged, they came back, and they started asking very intelligent questions. And I think uh, it is part of the whole revenue management process. That is a, a piece of resource revenues, even if it's, it has to do with the future. And so you, you need to go after these resource-backed loans. I want to thank the panel very much. Thank you all, and uh, please join me in giving a hand to what I think has been a good start. Could I have? You want? Would people right. please take their seats? Let me apologize in advance uh, for the uh, lack of a break, but the good news is that following this panel, there will be refreshments <laughs> for everyone in a reception that will be held right outside uh, the auditorium. Um, so we hope to make up for your uh, temporary um, postponement, postponement of gratification. Um, delighted uh, again to welcome our dis very distinguished panelists uh, for the second of our discussions, this one to focus more directly upon some of the policy implications of the question that was considered in the first panel. And I, to moderate the panel, I'm very pleased to have Ambassador Robert Hodak, who joined the National Intelligence Council uh, as the National Intelligence Officer for Africa in October of 1997. Uh, in September of 06, he was asked by the Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis to become an advisor on the project to rebuild the capability of the African intelligence community. And before joining the NIC, uh, the ambassador served as an advisor to the chief of staff of USAID and the president's Greater Horn of Africa initiative. Uh, he was previously served a variety of roles in the Foreign Service as negotiator on disaster assistance response team in eastern Zaire. He was the first American ambassador to the state of Eritrea and, uh, and had many other posts as well, including chief of mission in the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa. I'm delighted to, and I'm just, uh, that's only a partial listing of uh, Bob's uh, activities, uh, most of which have been centered on, on the African continent. So, Bob, delighted to have you, and Bob Hodak will introduce our panelists. Thank you very much, Howard. And I want to try and speed this up so we're going to have a little bit more time for questions. Uh, in the uh, Creole Patois of West Africa, this is the How For Do panel, or What Is To Be Done. And we have three expert uh, panelists to give us a little sense of direction. And in order of appearance, they will be uh, Bennett Freeman, who is currently Senior Vice President of the Calvert Asset Management uh, Group, uh, the largest family of socially responsible mutual funds in the U.S. Bennett served in government uh, during the Clinton administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, we have with us Dr. Stephen Krasner, who's the uh, Director of the Policy Planning uh, Office in the Department of State. Steve's a classic inner and outer of government and academia, having uh, taught at Stanford, uh, at Harvard, having served at the NSC, and previously uh, on the policy planning staff. And finally, we'll have uh, Simon Taylor, who is one of the three founding directors of Global Witness, uh, who I don't, I don't have to explain any more about Global Witness, I think. But also in 2002, he co-launched the public what you pay, uh, publish what you pay 
campaign, which was uh, one of the instigators, essentially, of the EITI. Uh, Bennett, would you do us the honors of uh, launching the panel? I'd be delighted. Thank you, Bob. Um, good afternoon, and I'm delighted to have the chance to address a theme that's been of great interest to me uh, since serving in the State Department in a previous administration, uh, a theme that's gained so much more attention on both the U.S. and the global policy agenda over the last several years. Uh, I won't be speaking in my capacity with Calvert today, although, of course, Calvert shares an interest with, I think, people of good conscience around the world in revenue transparency and accountability and good governance. Um, instead, I'll be drawing on my former State Department experience as well as role with Oxfam America and, and service now as an alternate uh, civil society member of the EITI board uh, and may even reflect a thing or two I've picked up along the way from Simon and other good friends at Global Witness over the last half dozen years. Uh, my very brief comments are going to focus on three interrelated areas. First, the close connection between U.S. energy security and oil revenue transparency. Second, and um, perhaps most potentially usefully, the convergence of interests between the U.S. government and EITI and in turn appropriate roles that, at least in my view, I think the U.S. government can play in supporting the process. And finally, and very, very quickly, the essential uh, civil society dimension of the EITI framework in the years ahead, even the weeks and months ahead. Um, first, the big picture on energy security and oil revenue transparency, and I'm not going to spend more than a minute on this, assuming that this was covered well in the previous panel. But, you know, oil revenue transparency was a fairly exotic um, issue uh, during the previous administration. Uh, first kind of got on my radar screen in the Human Rights Bureau in 99 when I think Simon and a couple of his global witness colleagues came into my office. Um, and they did, of course, pioneering work in developing the whole issue, first in the context of Angola before turning the corner globally with Publish What You Pay. Um, but the subject matter, of course, has gained traction in the U.S. in the context of post-9-11 national security and energy security imperatives, particularly with respect to the Gulf of Guinea and the Caspian countries. The core proposition is that durable, the durable foundations of access to and supply of oil are governments which are accountable to their own peoples, including to the peoples of their oil producing re regions. Without such accountability, the stability and even legitimacy of those governments are open to challenge. We've seen also graphically the last half dozen years, and particularly in recent months, the whole cycle uh, in Nigeria uh, where the lack of revenue transparency over the years, the lack of equitable forms of revenue distribution, the lack of good governance on the ground for the peoples and communities of the Delta, even with the democratic transition over the last half dozen years in Nigeria, has resulted in continuing violence and unrest, disruptions of supply, uh, production shutdown, uh, and indeed even spikes in oil prices. Um, we've seen overall oil revenue, the lack of oil revenue transparency, uh, skew basic governance, throw off rule of law, uh, and really distort patterns of development. But I think that against the backdrop of those stark issues and situations, that there is the good news that in the last several years that oil revenue transparency is now very much on the agenda of the international community, not only on the part of oil producing countries, but on the part of the G8 countries, and not least uh, on the part of the U.S. government. Uh, and I believe that in a bipartisan context um, that oil revenue transparency is here to stay uh, on the agenda of the U.S. government, uh, and appropriately so in a <coughs> joint national security, energy security, and foreign policy context. The even more specific good news, in my view, is that despite um, some delays uh, in the previous, uh, the first Bush term, uh, in recognizing perhaps the full strategic merit of EITI, that this administration, and particularly the State Department, has now grasped 
the strategic importance of this to the United States and is fully engaged in the process. And with Steve Krasner's leadership, the State Department and the U.S. government is becoming a real voice and force uh, on the board of the EITI uh, in ways which uh, we all hope um, will not only help that initiative gain traction on the ground in various countries, but do so in ways that will ensure accountability and appropriate roles and voices for civil society in the process. Given its enormous stake in the success of the EITI framework, I believe that the U.S. government has a number of tools at its disposal that it can and should deploy to move the EITI process forward. These tools span the range of U.S. government bilateral and multilateral uh, diplomacy and assistance channels and capabilities. And I think an agenda for U.S. government action can and should include several key elements. First, in my view, the U.S. government should press to widen EITI by engaging other governments that are not currently part of the process. Uh, Angola, of course, uh, Indonesia, Russia, Libya, and others. Uh, ultimately, EITI needs to be a much, much broader uh, group if it's going to prevail in its goals. Second, the U.S. government should, in my view, push even harder, not to widen, but to deepen EITI by ensuring accountability on the part of governments and companies alike for implementing their commitments. Accountability standards and benchmarks are at the heart of the current debate on the EITI board over validation criteria. And it's critical that these criteria are developed and applied rigorously, consistently, and independently. These might sound like relatively obscure process issues, and, and even that some of the debate is quite technical, but the validation criteria that are under discussion right now will go a long way towards determining the viability and credibility of the whole initiative. Third, in that same vein of deepening EITI by ensuring its accountability, the U.S. government should draw clear lines sooner rather than later as to the credibility of particular government's commitments to the process. The whole point of EITI, of course, is to improve governance and strengthen the rule of law in the context of revenue transparency. But the reality is that there are some governments, some countries, where governance is so poor and the rule of law is so weak that even the most basic commitments under EITI cannot be implemented credibly without much more fundamental and far-reaching change. In that vein, there are at least two governments in particular, Congo, Brazzaville, and Equatorial Guinea, which must be put on notice that there will be no free ride with EITI, whether at a candidate status or a full member status, when it comes to actions like arresting a civil society member of the EIT, EITI board, as was the case with Congo Brazzaville, or in the case of Equatorial Guinea, chalking up yet again another dismal uh, human rights record as reflected in the State Department's most recent country reports on human rights. I think that the U.S. government can flex some of its diplomatic muscles uh, more consistently and um, uh, seriously than it has with, with respect to those countries, particularly Equatorial Guinea, particularly when it comes to meetings with the President of the United States and the Secretary of State uh, for visiting heads of government. Uh, these are not good friends until they can prove their mettle when it comes to respect for human rights and at least an attempt to improve governance. Fourth, the U.S. government can reinforce its diplomatic efforts with bilateral assistance. Implementing EITI, of course, depends first and foremost on political will. It also depends on capacity. And the time has come, indeed it's overdue, for USAID and the Millennium Development Corporation to support EITI implementation through very specific technical assistance uh, that will support the mechanics of achieving revenue transparency accounting and budgeting in various countries. Another key assistance priority should be to develop programs to facilitate stakeholder engagement uh, in EITI implementation so that the process of, is one that builds governance and civil society from the bottom up as well as from the top down. And USAID does such terrific work around the world. 
uh, in this administration as it did in the previous administration and ones before that in supporting democracy and civil rights, civil society around the world. But this is needed very specifically in the context of EITI implementation. Fifth, the U.S. government can use its influence in the World Bank to ensure that new mandatory disclosure requirements of the IFC are enforced and implemented and that the regional multi -develop multilateral development banks follow suit. And I think that such requirements can and should also be extended to private banks ultimately through the equator principles. There's one other thing that the U.S. government can do, and I'm just going to allude to it because I'm quite confident that Simon is going to hit it right on the head here, and that is um, the time is coming for the U.S. Congress to legislate on mandatory disclosure for all oil and gas and mining companies in terms of the revenue payments they make globally and, and to do so on a country-by-country -country basis. You know, EITI is an extremely serious and well-intentioned voluntary initiative, and I believe that as a voluntary initiative, it can achieve an awful lot. But ultimately, there is a place for regulation and not just in the EITI member countries uh, in the developing world, but also on the part of the G8 countries. Let me just wrap up very quickly um, by emphasizing what I believe is a principle that must be at the heart of EITI, that energy security and supply depend fundamentally on improving governance and strengthening the rule of law in the supplier countries. EITI is even more fundamentally about laws and people than it is about revenue flows and budget accounts or about supply and demand. And that's why the accountability processes being developed right now are so critical and why the arrests in Congo Brazzaville and even more recently of Sarah Weiss of Global Witness by the Angolan authorities matter so much. That's why the U.S. government should deploy all the bilateral and multilateral diplomatic and assistance tools at its disposal. And that's why it must also view EITI as part of its democracy and human rights agenda, as well as an agenda consistent with its national security and energy security interests. EITI is all of these things, and the U.S. government has a golden opportunity to move the process forward in ways that are consistent with the full spectrum of its interests. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. <clears throat> Steve, you want to carry it, carry it forward? Sure. Um, first, um, let me thank the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center for organizing this meeting. Um, thank Global Witness for having pushed this initiative uh, uh, as far as it's gone. Uh, thanks Senator Luger and Senator Feingold for their interest in this issue. Uh, the question of oil re revenue transparency is obviously something that is critical not only for the countries where the oil is produced, for the people of those countries, but also for energy security at a global level. Uh, the United States government is committed to EITI and committed to a broader anti-corruption um, agenda. Uh, many of the things which, um, which Bennett Freeman uh, alluded to in, in his very astute and insightful way are things which we're already doing and are very much in the logic of what um, American government policy has been. EITI has made um, significant progress over the last several years. Uh, people recognize the need for energy, um, for, for revenue transparent, transparency in the energy sector. EITI now has a formal structure, a board. Um, a secretariat is being created in Oslo. Uh, the, um, I think the critical challenge, and I'll return to this at the end of my remarks, is to make sure that EITI is not just an empty gesture. Uh, and this is partly an issue that arises if you're thinking about countries that have signed up and not done very much, or even done things that are very problematic. Uh, but it is, I think, it will be a critical issue for EITI as it moves forward. And what we should recognize is, if I can take one analogy, if you look at human rights agreements, there's none, zero, zero correlation between you, whether a country has signed a human rights accord and its actual behavior, none. And what we have to be alert to is that that does not happen with EITI. It can't just be an initiative where countries sign up, 
get checks for having done a good deed and where nothing actually happens. Mm. And going forward, that will be the critical central issue for EITI. And I have to say, working on the board, I think it's an issue which all of the members of the board recognize clearly the supporting countries, the implementing countries, uh, civil society, and industry. The um, administration, this administration, has been very much focused in a larger way um, on the challenge of not just governance, but creating a world of effective democracies. Uh, if we could reach that objective, it's spelled out in the 2006 National Security Strategy paper. We would clearly make international cooperation easier. We would make war less likely. We would promote the well-being of individuals in their own countries. Um, we would enable countries to govern effectively within their own territories, and we would reduce the incentives for transnational terrorism. We know that effective democracy is not just elections, although elections are a critical component of effective democracies. We need rule of law, protection of minority rights, government institutions that have real capacity, alternative mechanisms of accountability, including civil society and a free media. And we know, and this is something that President Bush has said, and my boss, Secretary Rice, has said as well, that this is a work of generations. It's not a goal that's going to be accomplished in the next two, four, eight, or 10 years. EITI is one piece of this process, and there are many others. We know that oil has been a curse for many of the countries that have oil wealth, and we know why. It concentrates power in the hands of the state. Uh, it makes it easier for the state to develop resources to repress alternative voices. It leads individuals thinking about their own self-interest to believe that the path to self-interest is basically to get a position in government, and ideally a high position. And it has very high incentives for individual corruption. It is almost inescapable when you have resources um, which are viewed as public resources where the revenue goes essentially to the central government. We know that oil has been destabilizing. Uh, we know that it's produced instability in the countries, in many of the countries where oil is produced. And we know that it threatens energy security at a global level. Accountability and transparency are ways that this issue can be addressed. Not the only ways and not complete ways. They do provide a check on corruption. Uh, they are likely to enhance the possibility of providing better public services, especially in areas like education and health. Um, and if you do have effective transparency and accountability, um, you're much more likely to get solid economic growth, something that has actually not happened in many oil-producing countries. EITI is a mechanism for moving on transparency and accountability. It is voluntary, and I think its voluntary nature has been critical. Surely and clearly one thing that is essential is that it be voluntary for implementing countries. The multi-stakeholder organization of EITI is unique at the international level, and it's interesting to see how well it's actually worked up to this point. More countries are joining. Canada and Colombia joined last week. The United States has strongly supported EITI. We have encouraged other countries to join. We are participating as a board member, and we are providing funds to support um, EITI activities um, through bilateral, the bilateral activities of USAID. EITI is part of a larger anti-corruption agenda, which the administration has pursued vigorously. Um, we know that corruption is something that is deeply problematic if you're thinking about moving towards effective democracies and better governance. Uh, we've supported a series of transparency initiatives at the G8. We've used um, bilateral assistance um, to promote anti-corruption efforts in many countries. We've supported civil society, not just through AID and other age, U.S. government agencies, but also through NED. Uh, we've supported um, civil society activists when they've been harassed. We were very happy to see that Sarah Wicks um, had been released um, or allowed to leave, to leave Angola and, and has returned home. Uh, but we know that this is an ongoing problem and witness um, the board members from Congo Brazzaville uh, that were not able to, to attend the last board meeting um, in New York. The United States has the most vigorous um, act against foreign corrupt practices, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act 
of any country. Um, prosecutions have increased since 2001. We'd be very enthusiastic of other countries enacted similarly uh, aggressive legislation. The United States strongly backed the Monterey Consensus, of which anti-corruption was a critical component. Uh, we created the Millennium Challenge Account, and now the MCC, uh, to implement Monterey principles. And more generally, at a multilateral level, we've supported the UN Convention Against Corruption, the OECD Anti-Bribery Corruption, and the World Bank strategy on anti-corruption and governance. Uh, as you know, there have been a series of G8 initiatives um, at St. Petersburg last year, uh, at Sea Island in the United States, where we launched anti-corruption compacts, which are actually designed to look at revenue expenditures rather than revenue incomes, um, at Evian, and we're very pleased that the Germans this year at Heiligendamm will also make anti-corruption and natural resource transparency um, a critical component of the G8 meeting. EITI remains a work in progress. We, the Secretariat has been established, um, is in the process of being established. The Board will make decisions about validation procedures um, at its next meeting or certainly this year. Validators will be chosen. The critical, issue, uh, the critical issues, I think, confronting EITI are this. First of all, how many countries will actually be fully compliant by 2008? Um, Azerbaijan and Nigeria are the two pilot countries for EITI. Everyone on the board is hopeful that they will be fully compliant by 2008. It is important that they are, and it would certainly be terrific if other countries were as well. If no one's compliant by 2008, we're going to have to take a deep breath. Four years without actually any country fully impl implementing this initiative will not be a good start. We have been encouraging other countries to join EITI, um, the, um, including China, India, and Russia. Both the United States um, and the UK, and perhaps other countries as well, have pressed China on several occasions with regard to EITI. Uh, we've pointed out to the Chinese that joining is something that is not just an indication of good behavior and acting as a responsible stakeholder in the international environment, although it would be that, but also is something that's very much in China's interest. We're all enmeshed in a single global energy market, and if energy prices go to $100 a barrel because um, oil exporting countries uh, fall apart, that is something that's not just going to affect um, the United States or the UK. It's also something that will affect China. So we're hoping that China will um, see its way clear to, actually, to be an EITI member. We also know that EITI alone is not enough. It deals with revenue incomes. It doesn't deal with expenditures. But we do think that it's a critical piece and an excellent beginning. We're committed to making it work. And we think the most important thing in making it work will be the work of the board in the upcoming year where the board is committed to selecting validators selecting a validation process and a voting process on the board, which will make sure that EITI will not just become, as some other international um, initiatives have become, an empty gesture, but that it will be a real indicator and a real path for resource exporting states to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> Simon, you got the cleanup position. Oh, God. <laughs> Go for it. This all wrong. Um, <clears throat> how to follow all this? I think virtually everything that could be said about uh, implementation, delivery, and so on has been said across our various speakers. It's been quite a, a nice, wide ranging discussion. Um, I, I suppose I would uh, start off by saying, although we're producing a document and giving it out today that looks a little bit at um, US, uh, a US focus. You should take what I have to say to some extent in the context of the wider international effort that's going on. And um, I think, uh, you know, some of the delivery and, and push, as it were, from the civil society side really has to come back to the delivery from the, what, now 300-plus members of the Publish What You Pay coalition. So I just wanted to sort of reflect that back to the audience that um, this is now a huge global movement, and to a large extent we're 
you know, very grateful to have that huge coalition on side right across the world doing this work. Um, people have talked about all various things that need to happen. We've talked about payments, uh, transparency, receipts, transparency, budgetary transparency, and contract transparency. So I won't go into that. Um, I thought I would just focus on some of the sort of key areas that we've pushed uh, in the document that you've seen today, and then look at some of the disincentives and some of the other kind of wider components that I think would be useful to think about in the context of EITI and its capacity to deliver, because as everyone has pointed out, EITI is just a, a component of a wider set of things that need to change. So to start off with, um, uh, I think we would like to see, and you'll see why I think this goes beyond the United States, because the United States actually has been doing quite a good job, I think, on, on lots of these areas. Some of the other key governments have been doing a much lesser job, I would say. Um, so some of this goes beyond the US. Um, we would like to see, a, a, I think, a hugely increased diplomatic push um, for EITI coming uh, from the key governments that are interested in, and I think uh, Steve has nicely talked about, you know, bringing China and so on into the, into the fold. But in terms of traction with some of the most difficult countries, which was really the reason why we launched um, Publish What You Pay, and be, prior to the launch of Publish What You Pay, we're talking about this issue with various companies, are the most intractable governments, the ones where I think the best way of describing them is less from a sort of technocratic point of view that it's very difficult to get transparency in place, that you know there's corruption. As long as you talk about it in that sense, I think very often um, it, it, it takes on a, a kind of technocratic sense. You know, well, corruption's a bit of a problem. In many of the countries we're talking about, I, I think it's fair to say that the elites who run those countries see those countries as their private fiefdoms by this stage, certainly, and certainly over the last decade, we've seen in, in a number of countries where the, pri the principal aim of elites is to asset strip. I think that's the best way of putting it. Virtually everything they can get their hands on. And they take those assets and they park them through the international banking system in various places. I'll, I'll come back to that. So we need to see these countries for what they are. And, the, the, and that's the point where issues to do with sovereignty, I think, um, fail to ring true in terms of not being able to address these problems. I'll, I'll come back to that issue as well. So we'd like to see a greater diplomatic push that really uses all kind of imaginatory sort of approaches to bring some of these countries into, into a position where, where they really have to join the EITI process and take part. And some of that, uh, I think, could, could benefit from increased financial support to enable civil society to be able to, on the one hand, interpret the data uh, to be protected in the case of civil harassment. A lot of people talked about Sarah. I'm not going to talk more about that. Suffice it to say that the charges, which we believe to be completely unfounded, remain in place, and from our point of view, um, that's outrageous and they should be dropped immediately. Um, but I think Sarah comes uh, along the back of a pattern which started off with Christian and Brice from Congo, Brazzaville, uh, last year, where they faced nine months of what I can only describe as judicial harassment in the extreme. And really, that's, I think that's the other diplomatic push. We have to somehow work out a mechanism where civil society is able to participate. But there is no point in delivering accountable, you know, um, d delivering transparency over such revenue streams in order to create accountability of governance when there's nobody there to do the accountability holding. If the cost of being, you know, standing up and trying to, to deliver this is you get trumped up charges and thrown in the slammer, then I'm sorry, but that's not good enough. It's completely hollow. It's, it's irrelevant. We may as well not bother. So we have to do something about that. Um, I think uh, Bennett mentioned um, uh, you know, disclosure mechanisms. The, the reason we launched or thought of launching Publish What You Pay along with other participants was because by the stage Publish What You Pay was launched in June 2002, we'd already spent three years pursuing a voluntary discussion with oil companies, those who would talk to us, and I might point out some of them wouldn't at all until that stage, um, looking for, for a, a voluntary mechanism to get disclosure in place. Now, what we were interested in was never, uh, you know, hero trail blazing by any individual companies. We wanted a broad spectrum of disclosure such that the entire revenue stream was out. There's no point in only having half the companies. And uh, I won't go into the detail, but suffice to say some of you will know of the so-called BP incident where they stood up and moved forward and said they would disclose only to be threatened with being kicked out. And I think that really 
it shows the same problem, I think, with voluntarism in the most difficult countries. I, I completely accept that EITI is probably going to deliver a number of countries if we can get this right. I still personally have a real doubt in my mind as to the capacity of EITI to deliver in the countries like Equatorial Guinea, like Angola, like uh, Congo, Brazzaville, where, or like Cambodia. Let's, let's introduce Cambodia, just about to uh, get oil, hopefully, for them in a few years, or perhaps not for their population. Um, you know, where is, you know, how are we going to see a move? Where is the incentive for elites who hitherto have asset stripped everything they can get their hands on? Why would they want to be held accountable? And the answer is they don't. They have no interest. They've never been stopped. And when you chuck in the high oil price and the fact nobody's willing to say boo to a goose because of this problem of not wanting to upset the supply, then I think really it's just a non-starter unless we can add to some of these other mechanisms. So I, I think there's a real call now. We're now, from my point of view, nearly eight years down since we started talking about this. So we think it's high time now that there was a mandatory mechanism to simply require all the players to disclose. And if we did that, the beauty of that kind of mechanism is you would also force all the people who don't want to disclose to have to disclose. And not only that, if you take the Angolan situation, one of the reasons why we were interested in the SEC, for example, is one, one approach. There, there, there may be several other mechanisms, so we're not wedded to any particular mechanism, was that uh, in, in the Angolan PSAs, there was a specific clause that essentially said, uh, unless otherwise required by domestic legislation. In other words, you know, if you, if you required all the companies to disclose, you would move the thing forward. Now, granted, you may have a problem in moving forward uh, the national oil companies, but I think, you know, one can account for the national oil companies in a context where there's a large international participation like that. And not only that, I think we have to see this in the context of wider mechanisms, of which there are quite a few one could look at in terms of addressing the problem of what to do about the national oil companies as well. So we would like to see, I think... Uh, uh, a mandatory, mandatory disclosure mechanism moved forward with. Um, I th Steve's talked about uh, greater sign-up to EITI, so I won't dwell on that. We'd like to see some moves on that. Cambodia, for example, sent their finance minister, who, by the way, used to be Pol Pot's press secretary in, in a previous <laughs> job, um, to the Oslo EITI meeting, which was great to see him. I, in a strange kind of way, quite like the guy. He's... Um, He's quite an interesting character, but again, he's you know he's out of the loop. It's it's uh, you know it's the deputy sorry it's the yeah deputy prime minister who's the one who really holds sway in Cambodia in, with regard to oil revenue, and and Cambodia you know for the last decade has had something like five to six to seven hundred million dollars every year put forward by the international donor community to help its development. In the time, it hasn't moved at all on the Human Development Index, and certainly if you walk around the country, you certainly see that it hasn't. Phnom Penh is now full of cars and choked up with fumes, whereas previously it wasn't, so that's development of a sort, I suppose. Um, but there's really no substantial development across the country. Meanwhile, once again, an elite has asset stripped the country. They're about to get 2 to $3 billion on current prices within a short while. And so far, with a non-strategic resource, timber, um, in a non-strategic country, let's say, Cambodia at the moment, the donor community collectively, although there have been some very bright moments, most of which have come out of the US and a few other key governments, I might point out, um, the donor community collectively, collective response to addressing the problems of asset stripping in Cambodia has been a dismal failure. That's the only way to describe it. It is pedestrian in the extreme, and if that's the way we're going to deal with oil coming on stream in Cambodia, well, we may as well not bother going to the next donor meeting. So, frankly, we have to do something about that. And so that's, I think, an area where some diplomatic outreach needs to happen. Um, uh, civil society I've briefly touched on we need to see some protection there um, I think perhaps now I'll just move on to a couple of other things um, there's been a lot of discussion about um, banks and so on um, uh, some of you might be interested to know that we're interested in banks funny, funny that um, we've talked about banks for a while in the context of oil back loans I've had a number of arguments even with people about, well, you can't expect banks to disclose things. This is proprietary information, client confidentiality, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, to which my answer really is, um, who are the real clients in the case of oil back loans? I mean, the, the, the loans are solely about uh, you know, uh, provision of, of a mortgage, if you like, almost a, a, an amount of money pledged against future oil. Who, who owns the oil? The population of the country, in which case, frankly, in my opinion, 
at least the, the, the real clients in these cases are actually the population. So the, the, the banks really, I think, I think you could certainly morally argue, have an obligation to the populations to disclose rather than keep these things uh, confidential. And if they don't, then I'm afraid that makes them complicit in the asset stripping process. And I'm particularly thinking of one or two countries, but one in particular which I don't want to dwell on for obvious reasons at the moment, um, but who have turned uh, oil-backed loans into a you know, into a, an expert process in liberating additional vast sums which are completely unaccountable. And it's a little bit like, um, I don't know, um, it's like having a bathtub with two plug holes in it. Let's, let's put the plug in here because we're going to get the oil companies to disclose. That's great. And meanwhile, the water drains out over here because we don't want to go near the banking side of things. So banks really have to be dealt with. And I, I mean banks on the, on the basis of loans. And I also mean banks on the basis of asset stripping. I mean, you can't, you know, what is, we've talked about disincentives. What, where is the disincentive if you can steal a few billion dollars and park it in your favorite national capitals where you like to spend money on Lamborghinis and what have you? Where's the disincentive? It never gets stopped. It never gets blocked. The worst that can possibly happen, like, let's think of, let's name a few places, like Riggs. You know, Riggs gets terminated for its uh, hmm. largesse with, with Obiang, $700 million about a mile from the White House. That's subtlety for you. Um, Riggs gets terminated, find lots of money, but the money left. If this was such a big crime that that's the end of Riggs, why was the money not frozen? That's what I'd like to know. Somebody said to me once, that's about sovereignty. But... I mean, leaving aside the fact that, you know, Mr. Obiang was hardly elected, I think another question that could be put is who gave him the sovereign rights to asset strip his country? And as long as we give credibility to the whole, I think, that, I think that's, that undermines the whole principle of sovereignty. You know, and, and if we can't recognize that and move that forward, then that's a kind of disincentive, I think, that would move things forward. If you as, a, as an asset stripper had a reasonably good chance that someone sooner or later would find your money and freeze it, and not only that, you became an international prior and possibly even stood the chance of being arrested for it, then I think that would be quite an interesting dynamic to chuck into the ring. Um, needless to say, um, we're interested in that side of work and we are looking at where assets might be parked for a number of interesting places, so I won't say more than that at the moment. Um, I think I'll stop with that. Thank you very much, Simon. I think we're pretty well on, on schedule now, and I would like to see some hands go up regarding some questions for our panel. Yes, sir. Uh, second row glasses. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Ben Geeman. I'm a reporter with Environment and Energy Publishing. Um, this is a question for Mr. Freeman. Uh, forgive me, I got a little bit behind. You said it's time for Congress to call, uh, to require mandatory disclosure. Um, can you elaborate on that? I didn't, frankly, follow mandatory well, geez, disclosure sure. of what? There is no mandatory disclosure now for um, U.S.-based oil and mining companies, or for that matter, foreign oil and mining companies with operations in the U.S. And we're trying to achieve here through EITI, through a voluntary multi-stakeholder initiative, uh, a whole uh, process it will take many, many years to get not only companies to disclose revenue payments, but to get governments to disclose uh, what the revenues are they're receiving, and in turn what they're doing on the expenditure side in terms of national budgeting. And there is only in the, in the foreseeable future a limited extent to which that vision that framework can be fully achieved through EITI. And EITI, is, is, as we've all emphasized, is a, is a voluntary initiative. It's frankly the most that the traffic can bear with a great number of the governments that have signed on to it. Yet we have in the United States, as do other governments around the world, our own sovereign rights to pass laws requiring disclosure of, of revenue payments. And I think that the United States could set an example by beginning to raise the bar here by enshrining disclosure in law. Uh, this will not be an easy argument. There will be all kinds of uh, interests of one kind or another entrenched against it, but uh, the time has come to begin debating uh, this kind of legislation in the U.S. Congress. Uh, there are others here, including 
former Congressman Wolpe, who probably will have a much better sense than I will as to the near-term or even medium-term viability of a bill getting out of committee. But, you know, we, we can't wait forever to achieve revenue transparency. We've got to start somewhere. And, you know, just to tie back to what Simon said a few minutes ago, the situation with um, Riggs Bank and Equatorial Guinea should have been a wake-up call. And there were hearings on the Hill uh, about that. And the Treasury Department and I, and I think the Justice Department uh, were on to it, yet nothing has really ultimately happened. And I think that the U.S. has a real opportunity to start focusing on these patterns of corruption and the way to get at it is through mandatory disclosure. Go ahead, you want to add? Um, I, I just wanted to add to what Bennett said, um, just to remind people, when, um, when EITI was in the process of being launched in the sort of phase between the launch of Publish What You Pay and EITI, uh, two large oil companies uh, wrote to Blair saying that they were interested in mandatory disclosure, mm -hmm. disclosure mechanisms. So I don't think it's true to say that companies don't, you know, necessarily should have a problem with that. I think the, the beauty of a mandatory disclosure mechanism is it not only forces those who don't want to do it, in which case I have a question for them, why don't they want to do it? Mm -hmm. I think we have to remember here that, you know, it doesn't take too many years ago that a number of the companies that we all love so dearly were intimately involved in a whole range of different things, including, you know, offshore funny accounts, weapons being shipped into war zones through invisible subsidiaries that don't exist, on the books, um, slush funds and what have you. And I'm not just talking about ELF. So, you know, this is also an issue of company accountability. So for a company to stand up and say they don't want a mandatory mechanism, I have to ask the question, why? Are you for opacity so you can do these kind of things or not? Mm -hmm. The only rational answer is, well, I'm, you know, I'm worried like BP legitimately was of being put in a difficult position like they were in Angola. Totally understand, but if we had a mandatory mechanism that forced all the companies operating in Angola at that time to disclose, frankly, the Angolans would have had to jump in the lake and there would have been nothing they could have done about it. It would have been out there and the only company not disclosing would have been Sonangol. Well, big deal. We would have yeah. been able to work out the difference. And not only that, as I said before, there are other mechanisms. A lot of Sonangol's money, for example, came from at various stages, not just them, but, you know, uh, from others as well, from Exim Bank in the United States. If Exim had a provision at that stage and said, well, we'd love to give you the money, here it is, but you have to disclose yourself, that would have been another mechanism. If we'd had all the iffies having the same attitude and if we'd had the other export credit agencies, all of this involves cooperation. And I think the beauty of the EITI process is it has a number of g governments in place where there are, uh, you know, significant export credit agencies that play a role like this that could mm -hmm. also join force such that there is this level playing field. And that's really the, the just, aim here. Just one more word on this, picking yeah. up exactly on what Simon just said, is that there was some reticence on the part of major oil companies oh. to join EITI, and in turn there was reticence, as I recall well, circa uh, 04, 03, 04, 05, on the part of some in the U.S. government to fully embrace EITI mm -hmm. because of concerns over so-called level playing field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guess what? Mandatory disclosure, which will not be easy to achieve, I got no illusion about that, but mandatory disclosure will bring about the level playing field. And I think is ultimately in the interests of the companies. Uh, yeah. Can I add one note on, I mean, one cautionary note? Um, we should recognize, first of all, that <clears throat> while EITI is voluntary, it's not actually voluntary necessarily in terms of the way in which it operates in implementing countries. Sure. Implementing countries will have to make sure to, to be uh, certified as EITI compliant that all oil revenue is being reported, and that is something that obviously was, is within the sovereign right of the countries. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be cautious here also about not letting the best be the enemy of the good. It's very nice to talk about mandatory standards for revenue reporting. Well, if we could get all countries um, or all of the SECs around the, world, SECs around the world to do this at the same time, it might be fine. <coughs> if we can't, you're cre you will be creating not only an uneven playing field, which isn't so bad, but you'll exactly be creating an environment in which countries – and their leaders who are interested in asset stripping will find companies that don't have to reveal. And there will be such companies because they won't have to all operate on international markets.
So we have to be cautious, I mean, before we go down a path which in fact could leave things worse off than they are now. And I think at this point, EITI is something that has real promise. Mm -hmm. We I'm ought to Absolutely. focus on getting it to work. Absolutely. Don't disagree with that. Uh, Howard, you had a question? Thank you. And just picking up on, the, on this very point, I, I'm reminded of the debate that took place uh, when I was in Congress on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And it, I, it sounded to me identical in, in the nature of that debate, where the argument those who were resisting the Foreign Corrupt Anti-Practices Act was precisely the one that, that was just suggested that it could put some companies at a disadvantage and, and we won't be able to have any way of accessing those countries, those companies. I think the larger, I think as we look at that historically, um, I think most of the American business community now welcomes that because the good, responsible players welcomed the requirement that others had to play the same game. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Europe, as was noted, I think, by one or two of, you, of the panelists earlier, there's been other countries have now followed suit. Mm -hmm. Even the French are now mm -hmm. beginning to get a little bit tougher in their... Uh, in their national approach to the subject. Uh, you could just let off BAE but, but I, want, I mean, uh, is, there, is there a distinction between the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the, and the logical implication of, of uh, mandatory disclosure? Or is it the same argument that we being repeated? I, 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 I've, well, whilst I completely agree with Steve that the EITI is the thing in town, it is the thing that is being delivered slowly and surely, and I completely agree with that. And I, none of my suggestions or comments to do with mandatory disclosure have anything to do with any taking the foot off the gas pedal, as it were, for EITI at all, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't totally accept your argument about creating an uneven playing field or perhaps even encouraging others simply because I think some of the worst perpetrators that we're talking about, if we, if we go to Saudi, for example, then the, in, the international oil companies frankly aren't players. It's, it's, a, it's a homegrown thing, so we've always got a problem with Saudi, so I'm not quite sure what we do about that. But in a country like Angola, there are only the biggies who can do it. Now, China has moved in in Angola, but guess what? Total operates the block. You know, the, 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 the technology for ultra-deep water, water drilling, although the Chinese companies are catching up, is still very much in the domain of the biggest companies. And um, so I, and not only that, some of the Chinese companies and Russian companies want to list, if listing was one argument, but I suppose listing is the defining principle, or one of the defining principles about, you know, a, U, a U.S. in this argument, domestic sort of jurisdictional um, right to say, as it were, over that particular company. And also, I wanted to say, you know, for me, this is never about the US doing it alone. This is about France doing it, the UK doing it. Norway already, by the way, has done it. You know, Norwegian companies have to disclose already uh, on a country-by-country -country basis. And also, I think there's another thing to, to, to say. Um, you know, there's a huge sort of um, double standard currently going on. I can sit in London or anywhere else, frankly, with an internet access and see what, for example, Exxon pays to the US government. Try doing that as someone from Equatorial Guinea or Congo. There's no information. So if it's all right for a US citizen or, frankly, a foreigner to sit somewhere else and find out, or I can do the same for BP in London, why shouldn't it be all right in the country where in these countries we're talking about the vast proportion of the state income is, is from oil. So it's, it's not like, you know, okay, Exxon pays a lot of money to the US government, great, but actually it's a pinprick in this massive diversified economy. Similarly, BP's payments to the UK are minuscule compared to the very diversified economy. But oil in Angola is nearly, well, what is it, 87% of state income. I don't know what it is in, in, in Equatorial Guinea, but they've now got this ridiculous GDP per capita of $50,000 a year per person. You wouldn't believe it if you go there. Um, and so I, I think when it becomes so critical like that, there's a, there's a kind of obligation. And we talk often about sort of moral obligations around. I think there's a moral obligation to simply do it. I don't think there's any justification not to do it. And I think that, that those worried about moving forward can, can rely on the civil society community for whatever effort we can do, and we'd like backup for it too. We will go after the other jurisdictions and we will name and shame them for not moving suit. And I think because we've got enough weight behind us through the movements that we've had, don't forget this is EITI since 2002, but you know this work has been going on for much longer than that. So I, I do think we have moral weight and a, and a capacity to push things in a way that simply wasn't there four years ago. And so I, I think the argument to say no is just gone. I really think it's gone. 
And frankly, if I can add that mandatory disclosure, even though it's there's a zero chance it's going to come about in this Congress or hardly more than a chance of that in the next, is still a useful uh, goal to have out there. And if anything, it can help sharpen the focus on getting EITI to move forward in a credible and accountable uh, and relatively rapid manner. And again, I completely agree with Simon that the effort here is not in any way to undermine or to no, no, so, so. EITI or dilute the focus on it. It's got tremendous potential. But as Steve himself emphasized, EITI is not the only tool, and I just think we need to be flexible about combining some regulatory approaches with the voluntary one, mm. the big voluntary one that's already on the table here. Mm. Okay, let's cluster maybe three or four other questions. I see a gentleman that's already got a microphone, then this lady right here. Do I see another hand out there? Okay, well, let's, let's go with these two, and maybe we'll generate some more questions. Um, Hi, my name is Sefton Davi. I work in the World Bank team, which provides the primary source of technical and financial assistance for countries who want to implement EITI. Uh, my question is this. I've heard lots of people standing up here today and saying, hey, let's expand EITI. Let's get every country to do it. Um, as Simon will know, about three years ago, we used to love it when people said that because we we're really desperate for anybody to implement EITI. And now when I see a panel of people encouraging lots of countries to do EITI, I absolutely feel... Uh, full of dread. And I'm going to uh, illustrate this with a bit of accounting. I mean, we're here at a revenue transparency workshop, so I'll do some accounting for you. Let's look at the Baku to Plessy Chehan pipeline. Let's say eventually it does end up carrying its million barrels of oil a day. And at $60 bar dollars a barrel, we're looking at $60 million a day. Let's look at the EITI program. We get about $4 million a year split at the moment across 25 different countries which on a per day basis means that we have, compared to the $60 million a day value of the Baku to Plessy Chehan pipeline, we have $438 a day to support revenue transparency in one country. Uh, uh, uh. So my question is this, should we expand the ITI? Because at the moment I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sarah Prey. I'm the coordinator of Publish What You Pay U United States. Um, just wanted to ask a, another question about mandatory disclosure. Um, this is obviously at the heart of the Publish What You Pay uh, U.S. campaign and wanted to follow up on what the congressman had said about uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and wanted to ask why couldn't we amend the FCPA to include mandatory disclosure. Um, it sort of meshes quite well with the intent and purposes, and also wanted to ask Bennett why he's so pessimistic and why he doesn't think we could get this oh, passed. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not so pessimistic. I'll get to that in a minute, though. <laughs> Thank Actually, you. Actually, I'll just hit that right in the head just for a second. Look, I, there's no bill in the Congress that I'm aware of, and there's a lot of traffic for con this Congress to bear on all kinds of critical issues from climate change, you know, with the Gore hearing today and health care and everything else. You know, but I think the time at least has come for hearings in this Congress to focus attention, and maybe there ought to be hearings on, you know, EITI's goals and implementation challenges, and in that context, to talk about um, whether mandatory disclosure is going to make sense uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, so I'm not pessimistic. I'm pessimistic for this Congress, but this is something that should be on the agenda uh, and something that could be actionable in several years' time. I hope that's not too pessimistic for you, Sarah. Steve, do you want to address either of the two uh, questions? Well, let me say quickly, I mean, one issue here is, yeah, I mean, there isn't a lot of money to implement EITI, but the point is, and I think this is critical, if countries are serious about doing this, implementing countries, a little bit of the $60 million a day that's flowing through the pipeline can be used for EITI implementation. Mm. I mean, viewing this as something where we somehow out here, wisdom in the West from whatever capital it is in the Northern Hemisphere, are going to be um, providing the mechanisms and guidance and resources to do this seems to, be, seems to me to be misguided. I mean, if countries aren't willing to do it, if Azerbaijan isn't willing to just actually made a lot of progress on this. If they're not willing to commit resources to implement EITI, why should we think it would be successful? Um, the, um, on amending the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, look, I would only say again what I said before. We have something that's a good idea. It has done up to now 
zero, nothing, nothing. Not one country is, is fully EITI compliant. You know, before we start, you know, waving these big avenues out here, let's try to make this work. It is a mechanism that can work. Right. Let's try to make it work and focus on that. We know that, I mean, if you try to move towards mandatory, mandatory disclosure, you will have a huge political battle. And the groups that have sat on the EITI multi-stakeholder board and operated together very effectively would not share the same views about this issue. So let's try to make this thing work. Just on the, the um, money availability, um, I think one of my worries about EITI from the Secretariat hitherto has been always the lack of resources. It's just too big a job, not enough people to do it from various stages, and you, you and I have talked about that before <laughs> in the past. And um, so I, I, I also take Steve's point. I think it would be very nice to see some commitment, and if you're really willing to do it, there's not a lack of money to deploy. It's not, you know, not earth-shatteringly expensive from a country making billions if they chose to put it in. But my problem is I, I think my, my problem with some countries is we need to recognize that they have no intention of doing it, or rather the elites who control the key game in town have no intention of doing it. And so if we don't come up with some other thing, like we're going to find all your assets and seize them, and then where are you going to sit? What, you know, I don't quite see how that ever delivers in those more difficult countries. So we may be lucky. I, I'm not sure I expected Nigeria to move in to the extent it did, and it did, so that's great. Um, so I, I think where I think more money would be useful would be in helping civil society to to become really engaged and, and enabled to do it. That's what, and, and I think to expect, say, Azerbaijan, which doesn't exactly have a great relationship with its uh, domestic population in terms of anyone sort of having a dissenting voice, you know, that, that civil society might be somehow dependent on revenues from a government that might not want them to say things is a, is a non-starter from my point of view. So even though we want to see perhaps in this example Azerbaijan stand up and cough up some money to, to support its effort, I think somehow there needs to be more resources available in training, in work in kind, in money, hard cash, to look after the interests of civil society. Otherwise, you just don't have that, that part of the equation on the ground. And I, you know, 436 quid or whatever it is isn't going to do it, really, is it? Yep. <laughs> um, and you only need one case like, um, you know, the Christian Ambrise case or what we, I, I don't even know what we've spent, you know, dealing with the Sarah issue so far, you know, hiring legal help, um, you know, flying people around and all this kind of stuff. It, it's breaking. Um, if we have to do that everywhere, who's paying for that? Right. Um, Simon, I have a question for you. Has an effort been made to engage uh, regional or multilateral organizations to promote EITI with their members. I, I, th I think of the AU and their endorsement of the, of the NAPAD principles, and for that matter, even OPEC. I'm not sure someone was talking to me about approaching OPEC. I don't know. Sarah, do you know, or does anyone else know who's one of our group? About OPEC, has anyone? OPEC or OPEC? OPEC. Oh, OPEC. OPEC. There was a discussion about approaching OPEC. Um, I certainly OPEC haven't, first. <laughs> haven't tried them. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> the, 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 there was a move to discuss with African Union, but yes. dear, my dear friend Mr. Sasu was in charge of it at the time, and I, think, <laughs> I thought, given that he'd just been judicially harassing uh, Christian and Brees, I'm not sure how much of a start. Well, Big John was. might be better. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I personally haven't done anything on that, so I'm, I'm not sure some of the other uh, members might have might have moved forward. So, um, yeah. I see a lady uh, in the central there, and I see another question in the back. You want, no, you want me to cut it off before 5.15? Well, that's right? My schedule says, uh, says 5.15. We're going to get our money's worth out of this one. Okay. Okay. Please. Lady first. Okay. Thank you. I'm Laurie Regelberger from PACT and wanted to get a little bit more um, – advice on what to do about Cambodia since we mm. still have an opportunity to get it right if we really put heads and hearts and brains together. 